with these important words. Father God, we thank you for this day and this time together. Help us to trust in you like, like Peter did when he walked on water out to Jesus. Help us to never take our eyes off the prize and to know that you'll never let us drown. Give us the strength to trust in you more than the troubles that we may encounter and to help us to keep you at the center of our life. You know where our hearts are this morning, Father God, so help us to hear your voice and your holy word. Help us to feel your presence transform our minds and our souls so we can be more like your son Jesus, the one who taught us to pray this prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, Cornerstone. Help me thank our praise team for leading us in worship. Thank you, God, for leading us through them today. Great to have our praise team with us. I'm Mike Gillen, pastor here at Cornerstone United Methodist Church. All of you in our O'Fallon Sanctuary and our online sanctuary, it's great to be able to worship with you today. Our scripture for this morning is guiding us to understand that God wishes to lead us through life. Here's Psalm 37, these words of life meant for us today. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. 
Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger. Turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, this is a continuation of a message series titled, What We Love. Each week, I'm looking at different ways we can understand that what we love leads us to a a greater understanding of how we're created. We are created to increase love for God and others. So each week, we're looking at something that we really love. The scripture for this morning, Psalm 37, it's written in an ancient Hebrew language that is, is meant to encourage us to understand more about God than we might realize. It's meant to be remembered. It's a a poem, actually. Each of the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet are are forming an acrostic in Psalm 37. And so there are 22 strophes of this poem, and each of those strophes starts with the, the letter of the Hebrew alphabet in descending order. It's meant to help us remember this, uh, this, this wisdom psalm for us today. And this really is a psalm that's meant to offer us wisdom for life. It, it in fact, seems to be uh, said in such a way as to help us understand an, an old man is writing this psalm and he's looking back on his life and he's offering wisdom to younger generations who are repeating some of the same failed patterns of life that the old and wise writer of this psalm is seeing going on again and has done himself. And it reminds me that Psalm 37 wants to provide for us a way of evaluating our life and understanding how God wants to be part of every aspect of our lives, leading us along the way. And so there's this intention here to help us see that God can be for us the most important leader in our lives. Now, again, I'm thinking about what we love this this month. And as I was getting ready for this message, I was thinking about leadership. And this question came to me, do we love our leaders? Now, when I started thinking about leaders in our lives, I had a little bit of difficulty at first thinking about connecting love of leaders and leadership to my everyday life. And then I began to think about both who I am and and who I am for others. And I began to realize that there are leaders in our lives that are crucial to us that we love. Like, for example, for those of you who are parents or for all of us who have parents or parental figures in our lives that really matter to us, there are times when, when we are just changed by their leadership. Now, this doesn't exactly look like me when my kids were little. I didn't have a man bun. Might have wished I could have had a man bun, but I didn't have a man bun. But I did spend time at the beach. One of my favorite vacation spots is the beach. I loved taking our children to the beach when they were this age because they are totally dependent on their their parents for leading them when they're little like this. I remember so many wonderful times of helping my kids to appreciate, to love this great experience of being in front of the ocean or at a beach somewhere and just enjoying the the wonder, the excitement of the time, leading them to find fun. And and that relationship of, of parent to child developing in a way that provides a trust that will help in the future. At the same time, there might have been moments where I led one of my kids into a deep puddle at the beach that they almost drowned in, and they might have lost a a sense of trust in me for a moment or two, but but that was well recovered by the time they were teenagers and then lost that sense of trust in me again. I I think about how for each of us, we have parents or people in our lives who functioned like parents for us that we loved and love, that we trusted and still trust to guide us along our way. There are leaders in our lives that we love. And and I really think that very early on, from the very earliest of our days, certain figures in our life become crucial to us. In fact, it, it makes me realize that we are created to have leadership, those who will lead us. 
I think about how leaders not only instruct us and in, in just how to understand what's going on in our life, but they teach us too. And, and teachers have become some of the most important leaders in my life over the years. If you're a teacher or a retired teacher with us in worship today, thank you for the ways you are shaping lives even now. Even if you're retired, you continue to have an influence that is beneficial on those who were your students. And by the way, if you have parents who are not being good to you or students that don't appreciate you, we're, we're not only praying for you here at Cornerstone, we want to support you. I hope you'll reach out to me. Just let me know that, uh, that we can pray for you. Um, I think that being a teacher right now is like in any s- stage of life or any era in history is a challenge. And I have found teachers, crucial leaders in my life, and really all of us have times where we can be teachers to others, especially when it comes to faith and how to live better by faith. We can be leaders in lives of others, imitating the good teachers we have had in our lives. Leadership is crucial. I think about how tomorrow here in the United States is President's Day, and we're celebrating different presidents who have been crucial in setting the tone for and the direction for our country. We, we have an image of, uh, the next image is that of uh, Mount Rushmore, and, and it really reminds us of, of how important leadership can be in our lives. Something I think is important to say is that we don't act in the United States like our leaders are perfect. In, in fact, part of the way we structured government is we, we find the the weaknesses, the, the errors of the ways of our leaders, too. We're very honest about our leaders. But at the same time, we, we recognize we, we cannot move forward as, as a society of people without leadership. I, I realize that as I read the Bible, that the way the Bible talks about leadership, human leadership, is very different from the way we experience it in this society, in this country, in the 21st century. The, the ultimate form of leadership in the, in the Bible's language of both Old and New Testament is focused on the notion of a king and of a kingdom. And here in the United States, we are exactly, we are antithetical to the notion of a king. And yet, we see in our country and in classrooms and in families that human beings naturally gravitate towards those who will lead us, those who will challenge the leadership, and those who will follow. That there is something about human beings that naturally requires leadership in order for a group of humans to move together in directions. If we were to throw all of us into a, uh, an escape room today, naturally we would find some people are leaders who start taking the lead. Others are the class clowns, who are absolutely no help in getting out of that room. Still others show absolutely no signs of figuring out how to read the clues and then make anything out of them. And so those are people like me who you want to read the clue and then be quiet because I will be no help to you in the escape room. But we naturally find leaders in, in even games like an escape room that naturally emerge for whatever reason, but, but the resulting truth is that humans always look towards and call out leaders to lead in directions. I think that's because we are created to look for leadership in our life, and it comes from the creation of God to us. So I wonder today, can we imagine God as our leader? Is that something we can do? When I think about how to describe Christian faith or faith in God to people who are doubters, skeptics, or just simply agnostic about the whole idea of religion, I start by thinking about how we look for leadership in our life and different kinds of leaders, whether it's ideas or actual people or institutions or movements in a society— that we look to leadership because there is something instinctual about us that looks for someone to guide us along our way. And Christian faith orients us towards the only God that is who creates all, who 
creates us, sustains us, and promises to redeem us. And to me, it's, think, it's important to think about how Christian faith can lead us to a, a resource, a connection to an ultimate leader in our lives. So if we imagine God as our leader, I wonder how Psalm 37 can explain to us what kind of leader God is for us and what it looks like to be led by God. Well, in Psalm 37, it says this to us today. If we imagine God as our leader, then we commit your way to the Lord and trust in him. So there is this activity of leadership that requires both someone to take the lead and someone to follow the lead. In order to to allow God to be our leader, we have to be willing to commit to God and to trust God. And then to say, God, we're committed to you, we're trusting in you, and now we're going to accept the way of life that you're offering for us. What am I meaning by way of life? What I'm suggesting to you is this, that Christian faith can be seen by others in those who profess faith in God. That there is a change, there is an intention about how we live that's different from those who aren't following God. Now, there may be similarities. Like we can see in someone who's never gone to church a sense of compassion or or love for others. In the same way, we can see in people who are followers of Christ or Christians uh, errors in their way where they don't demonstrate grace, for example. But my suggestion to you is that as we commit ourselves to letting God be our leader, we grow in trust of God and in commitment to God, and we learn more and more how God's way of life can be reflected in how we choose to live from day to day. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. This is how we begin to imagine God as our leader. Now, God's leadership offers us a way to live, and it's important for us to decide we will demonstrate that we are people of faith, but also that we will find in the words of the Bible, in the traditions of of Christian faith and centuries of people living better by faith, we will demonstrate that we are not only trust in God, but we will find from our faith a way that helps us through life. The scripture, again, is written in a way that helps us think about a, a wise old man who's looking at the, the lives of young people around him, and he wishes to offer to them some wisdom because He's made some of the mistakes he sees them making. He wants to suggest God's leadership can change your life. And so here's what the the psalmist says. Do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who do wrong. Here the the psalmist is, is just looking out and seeing that people get stirred up when they see other people doing wrong things and profiting from them. People get stirred up when they see people who are doing evil things, harming people who uh, are defenseless. And, and the phrase that's used, do not fret, is one that in many ways is kind of a lost phrase to the way we speak English in our society today. But I think it captures an interesting kind of notion. In my ear, it makes me think about someone who is unnecessarily being anxious, being anxious in the way that you can't really do anything about what's happening except harm yourself by worrying too much. Here the, the second half of this portion of the psalm seems to reflect that by saying when you're fretting about the evil others are doing, you're forgetting they're only here for a time. You're worrying about something that is already fading. Don't fret, suggesting that God's leadership will lead us away from this kind of anxiety of worrying about what others are doing that we think is wrong. You know, in some ways, what the psalmist is saying is, it's something we teach kindergartners. You are responsible for you, we say. And kindergartners will come home and say, I learned today, Dad, I am responsible for me. And my response is, then go clean your room. Um, Of course, that doesn't reflect Psalm 37, does it? Don't fret about what's going on in the kid's room. Just be glad they're going to learn how to be responsible. Maybe that means they won't hit their sister later in the day. Don't fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who are doing wrong. Here there is this intention to redirect our vision and our, our, our mental attention span to move away from what 
might be considered to be other people's business and focus on our own connection to God and the way God wants us to live. God's way leads us to do no harm to ourselves or others, really, is what, what's happening here. We're, we're moving away from this intention of trying to, trying to do something to someone else or even harm ourselves because we're disappointed in what we see our life becoming. There's this intentional activity by the Bible, by the psalmist, this wise old man, to, to lead us in a direction that reminds us we're not created to harm ourselves or others. It's not what God wants for us. God's way is meant to shape us in a way that leads us away from harm. The psalmist goes on to say, trust in the Lord and do good. Take delight in the Lord, refrain from anger, and turn from wrath. Here we begin to see what God's way of life is. It starts with a connection of trusting God with allowing God to work through us to do good. In other words, there is this re uh, reference to good and connecting it to God, saying that this is how we know we're on the right path because we are involved in activities that bring good into the world. Now, one of the things that we often don't think about is one of the good things we can do is, is as the Scripture says, take delight in the Lord. What an unusual phrase, take delight in. That word delight is rarely used in in society today. It's not one of those words you hear kids using. But it's an interesting kind of notion. It reminds me of those days at the beach where the the little one is skipping along in the sand and, and running up to the edge of the of the ocean. And as the ocean tide comes in, they run away and the waves just barely, you know, kind of kind of nip at their heels. Isn't that kind of a fun image? That's what I think about when I think of delight. Now, how would we then translate that image, being a little child or anybody, running away from the waves and fun on a beautiful day where there's no sleet or snow or freezing winds driving through you, like there have been recently here in Missouri? How do we translate that into life with God? Well, it, it really is a matter of, of becoming aware that each day God is walking with us, and we have to choose to say, God, I, I want to just find some joy in what you're doing in and around me. It's, this is connecting the idea of delighting, having some great joy in God, and being grateful and joyful for what God is doing in and through us. This is connecting trust and doing good with how God is involved in our life. And what happens then is that our mindset, which naturally can move towards anger and being, as the scripture says, wrathful. Isn't there a, is there a better word for Old Testament kinds of justice? Is there a better word than wrath? I mean, isn't that what people think of when they think of the Old Testament, that God is a God of wrath? Here, Psalm 37 suggests we should move in a direction away from what angers us. In other words, the old man is sitting back and looking at these young folks and saying, and by the way, young could be, I think, 52, for example. 52, maybe? That's young. He's looking backward and saying to these younger folks, you know, life is, there's too much in life to be caught up in anger and trying to gain revenge on someone else. Don't waste your time, he's saying. He's suggesting that time is short for all of us. And if we spend more time trusting God, doing good in God's name, finding, of all things, delight in our connection to God, that, that's going to make for a better life than getting caught up in what other people are doing in a way that makes us angry. So God's leading us away from harming ourselves and others. God's leading us instead to ways that lead us to do good. God wishes for us to do good at every turn. Now, it seems to me if we want to kind of capture an Old Testament simple teaching for what it means to be faithful to God, it would be we embrace God and we do good in the name of God. That would be, I think, a very faithful kind of reading of the majority of the Old Testament. Also, by the way, the Old Testament talks a lot about how, well, 
we're imperfect. So we, we don't always hold to this way, which is why Psalm 37 is written to offer us some wisdom to get us on track, to get us on the path, to lead us along the way. Today, I think when I think about what we want from our leaders, we want leaders to benefit us and to and do things quickly for us. I, when I think about what people in our society are looking for in leaders, whether it's a parent or it's a teacher or it's a, an elected official, it's the person who's in charge of getting the snow plowed. I mean, we want our leaders to benefit us, and we want things done quickly. How many times have I heard someone say, listen, I am paying for this. Now, what they paid for is a little portion of something along with six million other people. But, you know, we all think we're shareholders, so do it for me now. I'm no different than you. Have you ever been on the highway and it's a crowded highway and then you hit a pothole and you're pretty sure you just lost a tire? Don't you say to yourself, they need to fix that pothole now. And you only have for talking metaphorically about it. Today we want leaders to benefit us. We want them to benefit us right now. My question, is this in any way connected to a biblical, Christ-focused, God-centered faith? Psalm 37 suggests a very different way of letting God into our life. The psalmist says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. So I might as well just be talking in ancient Hebrew right now because to us in this society, this makes no sense at all. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for the Lord. The answer, of course, that you all are going to respond to me right now, at least in your mind, is have you been around here lately? Why would we wait? The more we wait, the less that gets fixed. This is the challenge of letting God be our leader. The, the scripture, the, the thousands of years of people worshiping and following God tell us that one of the greatest resources of faith that we have access to is that God is God and we are not. That God's timing is different than our timing. That God's ways are not naturally ours. For some reason, we tend to try and make ourselves the God of our life, and, and we don't have the same kind of sense of what should be. Be, patient, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. There is this idea here that God's leadership is not about us first and foremost. It is about fulfilling God's purposes. And that as we agree to this, to be part of God's work, to be part of doing good, God's leadership leads us to fulfill God's purposes in God's time. This is just an aside, but the people in the media booth are really good. I mean, there is no way for him up there to know to turn to that screen just then. That was perfect, by the way. So make sure you tell Mike up there in the booth. That was really pretty impressive. I assume it's, I can't tell. I think it's Mike up there. God's leadership guides to fulfill God's purposes in God's time. So what I'm going to suggest is this, that in order for us to really embrace God as our leader, we have to allow for God to change how we understand how life works. That for us, God's leadership will be first. The intention behind us being born and living and continuing to live is that we will be fulfilling God's purposes, but that it's being done in a way that fulfills the, the timing God has. Have you ever been impatient? You thought to yourself, I've got to get to that meeting now and I'm late. Yesterday I was on the way to a training for CPR here at the church. We had a terrific training session for uh, some of our staff and key leaders here to CPR, uh, AED training, basic uh, first aid. Really appreciate Rob's leadership and leading that. We'll offer that class again and hope that people will take it. Um, I was late, though. I took a way that I thought would be faster, and I discovered that on Saturday morning, the stoplights all are red when Mike is trying to get to the, to the church. And so I wanted the Lord to understand I was very important to this meeting. How could the meeting go on without the pastor being there? Who would save a life if not the pastor at the church? And every light was red. Now, of course, there's an answer. Like, if I'd left 10 minutes earlier, 
everything would be fine. I know, I know, but that, that's not my point. My point is nobody was sitting at those stoplights turning them green for me. So when I get to the church, do you know what happened? They were already started. They discovered somehow that they could save lives without my help. Have you been in a situation where you wanted things to get done quickly? And after you had some time to look back on, say, weeks or months or years past, you realize that God was working with you the whole time and things worked out in God's time, not your own. Maybe you're at a point in your life where you're really not so sure about this whole idea of faith in God or going to church or the Bible, but you're giving it a chance. And I'm suggesting to you today that there are times when God wants to offer us guidance that actually tells us to stop, to not get involved in someone else's business, but to to just simply sit still and wait for the opportunity to do something that's good. God's timing leads us away from some of our instincts and leads us towards a different way of life. Now, to kind of summarize, I want to suggest to you there is a way we know when we're growing in love with God and trusting in God's leadership and letting God's way of life become our way every day, little by little. Here's some ways to know. We know we're growing in love with God when we are more peaceful, when we are not fretting so much. We know we are growing in love with God when we don't worry what others are doing, when we're I'm responsible for me rather than I'm responsible for telling you how to stop messing the world up. We know we're growing in love with God when we find joy in each day we live. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that every day we are just filled with joy, like some kind of strange commercial for joy. It means that in there are moments in each day where we allow God's spirit to break into our heart and mind and remind us that we are chosen by God and loved by God. This past week, we had a funeral for Bev, a longtime member here at Cornerstone. And as we were beginning this, the funeral service here at the church, I could see outside that the rain had turned to sleet. And I was thinking to myself two things. One, we have to guide a casket into a funeral hearse or a, a, a hearse in probably very dangerous concrete pathway. And two, there's a, a cemetery that is going to be a mess. So as we're getting to the, the entrance to the church and we're, there's this concrete kind of ramp that's a handicapped accessible ramp and it leads right into this half circle asphalt driveway where the hearse was parked. And so the, the young men who are all grandsons of Bev were the pallbearers, and they get to the entrance, and I, I'm wearing a liturgical robe and stole, and I say, hold on a second, fellas, and I grab this bucket of ice melt, and I'm s- scattering ice melt in front of them all the way. Now, to me, that was kind of this absurd look that I thought, well, how, it, somebody should be taking a picture of this, because you imagine, I mean, I mean, my kids are sure I only work one hour a week, maybe two. They would never imagine I would scatter ice melt out. That, somebody else is going to be better at that than me. What I thought was really funny, though, was uh, the, the grandsons, they're carrying the casket right. It's sleeting. We have a, an awning over that walkway, and the sleet is coming in sideways at like 40 miles an hour, just pelting us, right? There's an inch of slush that these guys are scooting through, trying not to slide down this little ramp, and then, you know, that'd be terrible, right? And the whole time they're saying, only grandma would have planned this. This is, this is definitely grandma, and they're just laughing. And I just thought, well, you know, you have someone who loves you dearly, who you are grieving has died, and yet her spirit can point you to a, a moment of joy, And we were just talking about how she was a woman of of really sincere faith who leaned on God when she was in trouble, uh, spiritually and emotionally, and and then how she found joy in her family. You know, they told this story about, at the funeral, about how um, at one of her houses, Bev had this bathroom 
when they were little. These are all adult men. Actually, three of them are pastors, which is really fun. One of the pastors told the story. When they were little boys, there was this bathroom in the house, and their grandmother would go into the bathroom, close the door, and what they, they learned was that the light switch to the bathroom was on the outside of the bathroom. So they would love to flip the light switch on and off. And to me, they found joy in their grandmother who was not with them, and yet through God's Spirit, remained a part of their life. We find joy in each day when we grow in love with God and in God's ways. And then we learn to wait for God. We learn to settle down, calm down, and wait for God to lead us in a direction. So how can we this week, how can we love God's leadership this week? How can we trust God and embrace God this week? I'm going to suggest to you it has to do with prayer. And a combination of prayer for ourselves and prayer for others this week. So this week, in order for you to love God's leadership and invite God's leadership in, do this first, each day in prayer, invite God to lead you. Just simply say, today, God, lead me. Just something really simple like that. And then, as you do that, just begin to eat, try and remember throughout the day that prayer. It's a simple, God, lead me. Three, three words. And just see what happens this week. Maybe as you're praying, admit to God what is distracting you from God's peace. Because if you're like me, and last week I realized as I was reviewing this message, after I had been to the sleet-filled cemetery, I was reviewing the message and realizing this message was written for me. Even though I wrote it, I didn't realize how much I needed it. Maybe this week, you're going to have a moment where you need to admit to God you're distracted from that peace in your heart that comes from knowing you're following God and you're working with God to do good in this world. Then, in your prayer time, be still in your prayers and wait for God in your prayers. Maybe do something like this. Maybe say to God, God, I am praying for this person, but I don't know exactly what to say. And then just wait. Or maybe say, God, this is what's really bothering me today, and I don't know what to do. Or I think I know what to do, and this is what I'm thinking about doing. And then just wait and see what happens inside of you. Will you hear something? Will you have a new idea? Will you realize later that if if nothing else, you've been calmed down in the moment? I'm suggesting to you God will arrive at some point if you're waiting for God. In your prayers, remind yourself to find a moment of joy in God's gracious gift of life. Throughout the week, just say to yourself, I want to find joy today. I want to find a moment where I I have some happiness, some joy. This week is a week where in prayer, you can embrace God's leadership and learn to love God's leadership just a little bit more. I, I think it's important for us, as I conclude my time, to spend a moment in prayer with you for me to lead you to a week of prayer. And I want to suggest to you there are a few people you can be praying for this week as you're both seeking God's leadership for your life, but you're also asking for God to be involved in in the care of others as well. You might want to pray for Alan, uh, David's brother, who is in the hospital right now and really dealing with some very difficult life and death issues. Maybe you can pray for John, who's been going through chronic pain for a long time, and he's really looking for help from doctors and from God. I know that Ron, this is Ron's friend, another uh, member of Cornerstone, who'd love for you to be praying for John. Or maybe you can pray for Kathy. This is Sharon's sister-in-law, who's got some really serious health problems and a surgery coming up this week. So as you're thinking about how to do good, start with your prayer time. Be praying for someone like Alan or John, or Kathy, people you really don't even know, most likely. But you can talk with God about them. And that activity of you seeking to do good for someone else, altruistically, will set the tone for your week and your your prayers as well. Let's take a moment right now, and let's talk to God about what matters most to us. Let's pray together. God, you invite us to not just be still before you, but to to wait for your leadership. Thank you, God, for your willingness to be involved in our lives every day, for the ways you encourage us to trust in you. This week, God, help us to find those moments when we we can find some peace in our heart and mind as you help us not to be anxious, but instead 
Help us to feel relief from what's making us anxious. Help us to see, God, that you're inviting us to join you in doing good in this world. And then, God, help us to take those moments each day this week where we can just sit still and wait for you to give us a new direction or a sense in our heart that you love us or an answer to a prayer we've been asking you to answer for a while. God, I am praying today for everyone who is involved in this worship, whether they're in our uh, online sanctuary or the O'Fallon sanctuary, that all of us brought together by your spirit could understand that as we love your leadership, we can learn to grow in love with you. Guide us this week, God. Be a blessing to us so we can be a blessing to others. In Christ's name, amen. Great to worship with you today. I'm so excited about uh, how God's going to work in your life this week. I hope you'll let me know what's happening in your life. Send me an email. Give me a phone call. Stop by the office if you're in town. Let me know how God's working and how you're growing in love with God. We've got one more song to sing. I hear that the praise team is here ready to roll. Let's, let's worship God together. Yeah, please stand if you are able to. We have one more song this morning. Resurrecting, I thought this was a great song with Easter not being in the, you know, so far distance. So please lift your voice with us as we sing Resurrecting. Jesus. 
7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to him. After today, my hope for you is that you will open your heart to God as he has open arms to us so he can straighten all of our crooked paths. Live better by faith as you go out into this world offering prayer, hope, love, and peace. We hope to see you next time. In the meantime, have a great day, everybody.